seriously. It was not uh, a lark. I had chosen this career. I gave up serious music, and I took this discipline with me to popular music. The music back when I first started recording um, was kind of loose, it was happy, uh, uh, lyrically there wasn't too much to really to say in a record, you really didn't have to sit back and think about an anything. And I think that's why a lot of the nostalgia thing is starting to happen again today and it's been occurring for quite a few years now because people I guess relate back to uh, the mid 50s to the early 60s as, as possibly good times. I don't know. They really didn't have that much to think about. There weren't that many problems. We had no big war situations. We had no big drug, uh, drug problems. So the music, I think, kind of related to that particular era. It was happy and just a lot of fun. It was, they, they were good days. Was it a dance floor item or gyrations that should be confined to the gymnasium? Back then, when Frank was singing, Frank Sinatra and Crosby, uh, it was the swoon era, of course. And, and, but he was still an idol, okay? When Avalon and myself and, uh, and Anka, and when we made it, we were, we were called teenage idols. And we were more or less put on pedestals. And we had to, uh, we had to generate a certain kind of... Uh, well, we had to be nice guys. And we all were nice guys. And I think... Uh, the moms and dads more or less kind of liked us an awful lot back then. Any more before going in for this evening's performance? They were great times. They were a lot of fun to do those shows. And for personalities like myself, Frankie, uh, Paul Anka, we were we were the matinee group, you know. The early in the morning, like say the 10 o'clock show till possibly uh, maybe 5 o'clock. That's when all of the girls were there, the screaming, the crying, the throwing up of things, the signing of autographs, whatever, who wanted to get married, kissing, hugging, so much gefelding was going on, right? But after five o'clock at night, then the guys came in. Now, the guys didn't want to know about Bobby Rydell and Frankie Avalon and Fabian. They wanted to hear Jackie Wilson, the Isley Brothers, doing 45 minutes of shout, you know, boom. Hey, hey, they cut an LP every time they were on stage with shout. So, and we would get booed off the stage. So, the morning and the afternoon shows were, they were our shows. The night shows, forget about it. Breaking into the spotlight this year were the Tornadoes with their big hit, Telstar. Also making news was four-year-old Caroline Kennedy, who usually upstaged her father whenever they appeared together. The divided city of Berlin was the scene of 1961's most disgraceful incident, the building of the wall around East Berlin to halt the exodus of refugees from behind the Iron Curtain. And after one of the longest and most widely publicized trials in history, an Israeli court in Jerusalem sentenced Adolf Eichmann to hang for crimes against humanity. In the U.S., Commander Alan Shepard started a series of successful manned space flights when he boarded this Mercury capsule called Freedom 7. This is a special time for rock and roll, and leading the music world with a sound and style all his own is an artist who leaves a unique mark on the roots of rock and roll and touches all who hear him. His name is Walden Robert Casado. Bobby Darren, I was somewhere, somewhere on the road freezing our buns off one night and we're in somebody's office to, ready to go on and he got a phone call in his shark skin suit and that real thin tie and he was beaming all over the place and splish splash just went gold splish splash i was taking the bell splish splash launches bobby darren's recording career as a rock and roll singer but he quickly softens his approach to find a much wider audience and i always felt as though bobby was really not in the same category as myself or later on in that time period, Paul Anka, Bobby always had visions of himself being in the category of uh, Sinatra or Sammy Davis. I mean, they were his, his idols. And Bobby, I can remember going around and doing one-nighters. We would do 41-nighters at a time on a bus, 81-nighters at a time. 
And Bobby was always a frustrated kind of a guy because, I mean, he was always snapping his finger. I mean, everybody was playing, you know, rock and roll. But Bobby was looking for that uh, Copacabana in New York City, you know, Las Vegas, headlining in, in Las Vegas. Oh, the shark, baby, has such teeth there. With Mac the Knight, Bobby Darren firmly established himself as more than just a teen just idol. A he became an international recording star way. and top cabaret performer. And it keeps it uh, out of sight. Bobby went through a lot of changes in his life. He was very opinionated, Bobby. He didn't like, he said, I don't like. Uh, he was very strong. He made statements in the press that I would see Bobby, and I'd say, Bobby, what are you doing? Why do you say these things? And he would say to me, Frank, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. I want to make a mark. He made a statement about being uh, uh, bigger than Sinatra by the time he was 25 years old. And that really... Uh, became a very controversial kind of a statement to make in this country. But he had his set ways what he wanted to do. And then when he said, no more tuxedos, no more Las Vegas, I'm the new Bob Darren now, I'm not Bobby Darren. He meant it, believed it, I think, when you look back at it today, Bobby Darren was way ahead of his time. I ran into him at a party after he had changed his old image and his style, and he was into jeans and denims, and he took the piece off. He didn't wear his toupee anymore. And I took him over to the side, and I said, Bobby, what are you doing? He said, I don't want to be plastic anymore. If I were a carpenter, Bobby was so unique that he just surpassed all of that and went on and wanted to do uh, what he wanted to do. That was Bobby Darren. 